10. Albanian Underground Air Base Built near a mountain outside the city of Ledse in northern Albania, the Yarda Air Base was originally meant to prevent the Yugoslav Air Force from entering the country's airspace. Construction began in 1969, and the base was completed in the mid-70s. It took a long time to build the base due to its complex features, which include tunnels built directly into the mountain. These passages were used for storing aircraft, and had enough room for around 50 planes plus personnel. In 1997, members of a rebel movement stormed the base amid a national revolt against the Albanian government. They destroyed several buildings, including the control tower, and the soldiers who were stationed at the property fled, leaving it abandoned. The ruined structures were never rebuilt due to a lack of funding, and in 2000, all flying operations to and from the base ended. There's currently no permanent military presence here, and the site functions as a storage facility for planes that have been taken out of service. Over 70 aircraft sit both outside and in the tunnels, falling further into decay alongside the equally dilapidated installations that have also been left to rot. 9. Lake Norman Mystery Wreck In 2013, firefighters from the Charlotte Fire Department in North Carolina discovered a submerged seaplane in Lake Norman using sonar technology. The aircraft wasn't visible from the surface. It was sitting at the deepest part of the lake, 90 feet 27 meters below the water's surface. To get a closer look, the fire department sent divers to the site, where they identified the wreck as a single-engine, single-seat plane. The crew couldn't get the aircraft's doors open, but they searched thoroughly enough to know that there were no remains of crash victims inside. One woman, Barbara Anderson, thought the plane might be hers. Thirty years before the discovery of the sunken seaplane, Anderson's plane went missing. She ultimately learned that it rolled into the water and sank when flight instructors who were using it for training forgot to engage the parking brake properly. Anderson had spent years and thousands of dollars searching for her missing plane to no avail. As of November 2013, the Federal Aviation Administration was attempting to figure out who the owner of the plane was, and vowed not to remove it from the water until that determination was made. Whether or not the owner has been reunited with their plane remains unknown, as the stories remained conspicuously absent from the news since then. 8. Disputed Jumbo Jet Back in 2016, the owner of the Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum in McMinnville, Oregon, ran into money problems. A foreclosure auction of the nonprofit's assets was scheduled when he decided to declare bankruptcy at the last minute, putting the sale on hold indefinitely. The foundation's trustee, Lisa Anderson, told Oregon Live that the organization had tried to negotiate the sale of its assets to satisfy a $2.2 million debt to a construction company after already ponying up $150 million. But the parties simply couldn't come to an agreement prompting the decision to go bankrupt. Six years later, the matter is still being settled. The Yamhill County Sheriff's Office recently announced that a derelict Boeing 748 jumbo jet that sits outside the former museum will soon be sold at a foreclosure auction. Across the fuselage, the plane bears the name of the former company, Evergreen International Aviation. The once worldwide company was founded in 1960, but abruptly went out of business in late 2013, shortly before filing for bankruptcy the following year. Entrepreneur Bill Stoller, whose company McMinnville Properties owns the property, hopes to secure ownership of the plane when the sale rolls around on July 25th. It's unclear whether this is likely to happen, especially since the museum's troubles date back to its previous owners, who began selling off iconic aircraft years ago to settle debts. And even if the company acquires the plane, they're admittedly unsure of exactly what they'll do with it, according to Wayne Marshall, who heads the McMinnville Properties' parent company, the Stoller Group. For now, the plane's future hangs in the balance as it sits at the center of a tedious legal back and forth between potential owners, who seem to lack a clear vision of what they plan to use it for. 7. Ohio Aircraft Graveyard When World War II ended, the US military no longer needed most of the equipment it had used in the fight against the Axis powers. A lot of the machinery was left to deteriorate in machine graveyards, many of which still exist today. Earlier this year, urban explorer and photographer Johnny Jew explored one of these sites in rural Ohio. He was driving around in search of abandoned buildings when he noticed a large open space on the map he was using. Out of curiosity, Johnny went to the site and encountered the sad, rusting remains of fighter jets and other military and civilian aircraft sitting in the snow, surrounded by trees and scrap metal. He crossed paths with the property owner, who allowed him to look around and offered some history on the site while the explorer snapped photos. The owner told Johnny that the collection was amassed by a scrapyard worker named Walter Soplata, who began buying decommissioned military aircraft and reassembling them in his backyard during the late 1940s. There are around 30 planes at the site including a deteriorating F-8060 fighter plane, a US Air Force B-25 plane, and an old Boeing 727. Supplanter left the site to his family when he passed away in 2010. 
They do their best to keep its location a secret to prevent thieves from stealing and scrapping parts from their historic vehicles. 6. Lockheed P-1 Ventura The twin-engine Lockheed P-1 Ventura patrol bomber first saw combat in Europe in 1942 with the British Royal Air Force RAF. The following year, the US Navy used it for fighting in the Pacific Theater. The US Army Air Forces US AAF, various British Commonwealth forces, and other militaries have also used the plane. In 1944, a wrecked Lockheed P-1 Ventura was abandoned at the Talisi Airfield in Papua New Guinea after it was hit by a shell during a raid on the nearby Rabaul Township. The pilot, Royal New Zealand Air Force Flight Lieutenant Frederick N. R. Thomas, eased the aircraft craft to Tallahassee as gracefully as he could on one engine. It made a hard landing, but thankfully, nobody was hurt. Thomas received the Distinguished Flying Cross DFC Award for successfully executing the forced landing. The runway at Tallahassee was too short for the bomber to take off from, and they didn't try to fix it. Instead, it was stripped for parts and abandoned, and it remains at the site to this day. If you had a chance to fly in a military aircraft and experience its high-speed capabilities, would you? Tell us in the comments, and hit subscribe while you're at it. 5. Beautiful Betsy One day in February 1945, as World War II entered its final months, a B-24 Liberator bomber nicknamed Beautiful Betsy vanished while flying across Australia from Darwin to Brisbane. Six American service members and two British soldiers disappeared along with it. The plane had been damaged during previous bombing missions. By then, it was only being used for short flights and was slated for retirement. Numerous expeditions failed to find the missing aircraft, and its fate remained a mystery until 49 years later, when a park ranger discovered the wreck in Kroombit Tops National Park while surveying wildfire damage in 1994. The blaze had cleared overgrowth, leaving enough of the plane exposed for the ranger to see it glistening in the sun. Specialists from the US Army investigated the site and collected human remains. The wreck was then opened to the public and remains in place today, serving as an ever-present reminder of a once-forgotten tragedy. 4. St. Augustine Plain Graveyard In early 2009, Photographer Walter Arnold discovered a roadside lot filled with rusting historic planes in St. Augustine, Florida. He had no idea at the time that the images he snapped would help launch his career, or that he'd someday help to spread the history of how the planes ended up at the site. They were identified as Grumman S-2 trackers. The S-2 tracker was the first anti-submarine warfare aircraft used by the US Navy. It was designed and built during the early 1950s and remained in service under the American military until the mid-70s. Arnold recorded the tail fin numbers on the abandoned aircraft. With the help of a friend, he managed to track down the names of pilots who'd flown the graveyard's planes during their military careers. One former pilot, George Verney, even found photos of some of the planes from back when they were still in operation. But why did they end up on a seemingly random property in northern Florida? They were moved there from the Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Arizona, the world's largest largest aircraft boneyard. As part of an agreement to provide Turkey with some planes to replace its outdated fleet, the deal came after Ayatollah Khomeini took over Iran in 1979 and shut down all US installations throughout the country, including those that were being used to monitor Soviet activity. American authorities agreed to give the planes to Turkey in exchange for being able to establish new listening stations there. While at least 11 S-2 trackers made their way to Turkey, getting the planes there proved to be a bureaucratic nightmare. It took time, and and eight of the aircraft were eventually declared unfit for service and were simply left at the lot. Unfortunately for explorers and history enthusiasts, they were removed in recent years and survive only in photographs. 3. Antonov AN-24 Behind some buildings in the residential neighborhood of Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, there's a noticeably out-of-place decommissioned Antonov AN-24 plane. Only 1,264 of the Soviet turboprop aircraft were produced between 1959 and 1979. The AN-24 was far from glamorous, but it was built to withstand harsh conditions. It needed minimal maintenance and was capable of taking off from and landing on unpaved runways. This type of plane was perfect for Mongolia's challenging geography and climate. During the 1960s and 70s, the country's air force and two civilian operators acquired several AN-24s. But like all aircraft, they eventually became outdated and they were parked in residential areas after they were taken out of service. The Curiosity placed 77-foot-long, 23-meters AN-24 that remains visible today belongs to the local School of Mechanical Engineering and Transportation and is used for educational purposes. 2. Bali's Abandoned Planes 
There are at least four abandoned planes of unknown origin throughout the Indonesian island of Bali. One of them, a Boeing 737 passenger jet, is located at an abandoned quarry just minutes away from the Pandawa beach near the southern coast. It sits in a field along a busy highway but feels like it's a world away from the hustle and bustle of the rest of the island. The 737 is a popular tourist attraction, but anyone who goes there searching for answers about how it got there in the first place is likely to leave disappointed. Nobody seems to know the story behind why the aircraft was seemingly plopped down into the field one day and was left to deteriorate, and if anyone does know anything, they've kept quiet about it. A local rumor holds that there were once plans to convert the aircraft into a restaurant, but the owner ran out of money. But these claims are unverified, and in some ways, that's not a bad thing. In fact, many people are actually drawn to the site by the plane's mysterious past, and they might find it less interesting if they knew where it came from and why. Either way, the property owner is happy to let visitors look around, for a price, of course. After the plane began attracting tourists, they installed a gated fence and hired a security guard to ensure that anyone who wants to take a peek pays for the opportunity. There are also two other abandoned 737s in seemingly random places throughout Bali, including one that sits next door to a Dunkin' Donuts and almost touches the building, as well as a McDonnell Douglas DC-10. Little is known about how any of these decaying aircraft ended up at their current resting places, but many suspect that they're the result of failed business ventures. One. MI6 Chopper During an oil prospecting expedition in 1981, an MI6 helicopter stopped to refuel at the Kalompur base in Russia's Yamolo Nenets region, roughly 1,500 miles kilometers outside Moscow. Five minutes after the chopper took off, its engines failed, forcing its pilots to crash land in a swamp. Thankfully, nobody was hurt, but the chopper was severely damaged. An investigation revealed that workers at the base had accidentally filled the fuel tanks with a mixture of gas and water, which is what killed the engines. Over 40 years later, the wreck is still sitting in the swamp, and as far as anyone knows, there are no plans to remove it. The Mil MI6 was a heavy transport helicopter that was built for both military and civilian use. It was first built in 1959 and was the largest helicopter in production until it was superseded by the Mil MI26 in 1980. The colossal chopper is normally flown by a flight crew consisting of at least five members and can seat up to 65 armed troops. It can also carry vehicles and other large bulky loads of equipment. Over 900 MI6s were built before the model was retired in 2002. 8. Aircraft Graveyard Located at the Davis Monthan Air Base in Arizona is one of the largest aircraft graveyards in the world. Over 4,000 aircraft of all varieties have been gathered here since World War II, all lined up and neatly parked in rows. These make up the 309th Aerospace Maintenance and Regeneration Group, AMARG. It's commonly known as the Boneyard, and the US Air Force began keeping its supply of aircraft there in 1946. At first, it was used for Air Force aircraft only, but beginning in 1962, planes from the Navy, Army, and government agencies were brought here as well. Because Arizona's hot and dry with minimal humidity and rain, the planes take longer to rust and deteriorate. At the base, there are planes dating back years and models of different shapes and sizes. Fighters, commercial jets, helicopters, and small planes are among them. Some are new and some are older and can no longer fly. One worth noting is the Boeing 707 of Pan Am. It was the most important international airline in the US from the 1930s until it went bankrupt in 1991. Many of the planes have their windows, doors, and other vulnerable sections secured. That being said, just because they're covered does not mean they're useful. Several aircraft are sent to this location are deconstructed, and their parts are reused. 7. Red Army Tank In 2015, workers uncovered an abandoned Red Army tank in a marsh in Seno, Belarus. The tank dates back to 1941, known as a KV-1 or Clement Voroshilov-1, after a Soviet Union marshal. The KV-1 was the Soviet military's primary heavy tank when the Germans invaded in 1941. Its large armored plate made it particularly effective against most German anti-tank weaponry. Salvage personnel worked together to rescue the tank after it had been submerged in the marsh for almost 70 years. The tank turret was upside down and split from the chassis during the procedure, indicating that the vehicle was riddled with electrical charges. It's unknown if the tank was intentionally wrecked before it became stuck in the mud, or if the damage occurred after the tank became stuck. The chassis also showed traces of suspected fire damage. 
The tank might have been employed at the Battle of Senno during World War II, which involved around 2,250 tanks in all. 6. Landing Craft Tank 326 In 1943, the British warband Landing Craft Tank 326 LCT vanished with 14 crewmen on board. Army commanders decided that it was most likely destroyed by poor weather or a mine and sank somewhere off the coast of the Isle of Man. Last year, marine experts discovered the ship off the coast of Bardsley Island in northern Wales. It was discovered 25 miles south of where scientists thought it had always been. According to new research, the vessel's escort ship, HMS Cotillion, last saw LCT-326 in the region where it was discovered, despite official records saying it sank off the Isle of Man. The wreckage was found split in two, 300 feet below the surface of the ocean. Although its identification was unknown when the news broke, odds are it is LCT-326, given the ship lies directly in the route of the flotilla it was traveling with when it vanished. The buried vessel is 190 feet long and 33 feet wide, matching the measurements of the LCT-326. LCT-326 and others look like it were designed to land armored vehicles and take part in amphibious operations like D-Day. The freshly found ship looks to have gone down in stormy waves, breaking in half before sinking to its ultimate resting place. 5. SS Thistle Gorm SS Thistle Gorm was built by Joseph Thompson & Sons in England and was launched in June 1940. The 415-foot steamship was powered by a triple-expansion three-cylinder engine with 1,850 horsepower. When the ship was called to serve the war effort, a 4.7-inch anti-aircraft gun and a heavy-caliber machine gun were added to the stern of the ship. On June 2, 1941, SS Thistlegorm set sail from Glasgow bound for Alexandria, Egypt on her fourth and last journey. The ship was supposed to deliver much-needed equipment to British soldiers in northern Africa. It stated that the ship was only carrying motor parts, but in reality, it was loaded up with everything ranging from boots and rifles to freight cars and motorcycles. At some point during the Thistlegorm's journey to the Red Sea, German intelligence received reports of a large troop transport ship in the area. Two German bombers dropped two bombs, striking the ship's cargo hold. Because the ship was loaded up with all kinds of ammunition, this resulted in an explosion strong enough to get the enemy's attention. Two days later, the enemy returned and sank Thistlegorm. Nine of the 42 men on board were killed. In the 90s, the site became a popular wreck diving destination. The wreck is broken into two pieces, with the stern twisted 90 degrees, lying on its port side at 105 feet. The bow sits upright at about 52 feet. The ship is still packed with vehicles, weapons, and other paraphernalia from World War II. Would you like to dive down and see this wreck site? Let us know in the comments and hit subscribe while you're at it. 4. The Tanks of Flamenco Beach After Spain surrendered Puerto Rico to the United States in 1901, President Theodore Roosevelt assigned all public land on Culebra to the Navy. This land was utilized for test landings and ground maneuvers, as well as bombing practice beginning in 1936. Equipment and weapons were brought to the island despite there being no facility, and bombing practice went on for decades. In 1969, missiles struck the island as training for the war in Vietnam went on for Navy pilots. The Navy's usage of the islands did not sit well with the people, who began to push back when the military sought to remove the whole population. Culebra people initiated non-violent protests in the summer of 1970 with the intention of eliminating the island's naval occupation. They marched, had sit-ins, and set up barricades. After seven months of protesting, the Navy finally decided to scale down on its use of the island for testing and training. By 1975, Culebra was free of Navy training. Though most of it was cleared away, the massive tanks were immobile and were just left to rust. The salty sea breezes corroded the metal, causing it to rust and collapse, and the villagers repainted the abandoned hulks. The tanks are still there now and have become a distinctive feature on the otherwise immaculate beach. New graffiti is constantly being placed on top of the old, giving the ancient war machines an almost joyous new lease of life. 3. Covenanta in Vineyard Denby, an English wine estate, has uncovered a pretty unique feature of its land in the form of an abandoned World War II tank. The tank was known as the Covenanta, 
a sort of light cruiser tank that served as the British Army's backbone in the early years of the war. The Covenanters, who were rather weakly equipped and undergunned, were practically outdated as soon as they were launched in 1938 and were obsolete by 1940. They saw little to no active service outside of the UK and were primarily used to re-equip British units as the army redeveloped after Dunkirk. They were also used for training by British and Commonwealth armoured units before being replaced by newer British models such as the Churchill and Cromwell and also the famous American Sherman. One shot looks to have blasted the turret completely off since it was not retrieved with the tank's main chassis. However, after a little more digging, it was discovered and reunited with its parent cadaver. It was said that when it was time for the Canadians to go home, they buried their tanks instead of taking them home. In 1983, at least one more tank was discovered underground in the vicinity and removed. It's presently housed at the Bovington Tank Museum in Dorset, where it's been restored to its former splendor. 2. H.L. Hunley On August 12, 1863, the H.L. Hunley landed at Charleston, escorted by James McClintock and Gus Whitney, one of the sub's financiers. The Hunley was soon tested in Charleston Harbor by the crew. Frustrated with McClintock's speed, the Confederates captured the Hunley submarine and handed it over to Lieutenant John Payne, a Navy officer attached to the CSS Chicora. The Hunley was anchored at Fort Johnson on August 29th, preparing to sail for her first attack on the blockade when it sank at the dock. There are contradictory accounts of what occurred. Some said that the wake of a passing ship filled the Hunley's open hatches with enough water to sink it. Others said that the mooring lines of another ship became entangled with the sub, pushing it onto its side and submerging its hatches. Whichever occurred, the consequences were the same. The Hunley sank quickly, killing five of their crew. Payne, who was on top of the submarine, leaped into the ocean and was rescued. Charles Hasker, imprisoned by the hatch cover, rode the sub to the bottom before releasing himself and swimming to the surface, while William Robinson escaped through the aft hatch. The retrieval of the submarine took weeks, during which time Horace Hunley arrived in Charleston and asked that the submarine be delivered to him. General P.G.T. Beauregard authorized the request, and Hunley dispatched a new crew of soldiers. Horace Hunley planned a boat display in Charleston Harbor on October 15th. He said that his ship would dive beneath the CSS Indian chief and emerge on the other side. The submarine was never seen again once it vanished beneath the waves. Divers did not retrieve the H.L. Hunley until November 7th. It was discovered deep in the channel, its bow submerged in muck and its stern floating. When the doors were opened, a terrible scene unfolded, with the second crew members appearing frozen in time. Thomas Park was discovered in the aft conning tower. Horace Hunley was in the front conning tower still clutching a lantern. The rear ballast tank valve was left open, allowing the submarine to fill with water according to rescuers. The tool required to activate the seacock was discovered on the submarine's bottom, prompting them to assume Hunley had either forgotten to close the valve or had misplaced the wrench and wasn't able to do so. The keel weights on the sub had been partially released, indicating that the crew understood they were in danger, but were too late to save themselves. 1. The Ghost Fleet of Mallows Bay The greatest shipwreck fleet in the Western Hemisphere is half sunk and decomposing on the Maryland bank on the Potomac River, just west of Chesapeake Bay. Hundreds of US boats were taken to Mallows Bay in the early 20th century to be destroyed and scrapped, and the remnants may still be seen in the shallow water today. When the United States entered World War I, the tale of the vessels at Mallows Bay began. The United States possessed ships, but a lack of transport boats prompted President Woodrow Wilson to sanction the biggest construction program in history in April 1917. An order for 1,300 foot to long steamships to be completed in less than 18 months, with each ship costing the public about a million dollars. The shipbuilders were on a time limit and had a lot to do. So to speed up the process and save money, they used wood instead of expensive steel. In October 1918, a congressional report showed that a mere 134 ships were completed. It was over a year and a half into the program, which was not on schedule. A lot hadn't started yet, and 260 sat half-finished. Germany surrendered on November 11, 1918, and none of the ships had crossed the Atlantic. 
Until that point, the program paid for 731 wooden steamships. Despite the fact that 130 ships were completed, only 98 were delivered. And 76 of them were really only used to transport freight. The shipbuilding industry persisted after the war. The government received a total of 264 steamships in September 1919. Because the US no longer needed the ships, they were left to waste until it was established what else they could be used for. The 1960s saw a fresh attempt to clean up the region, with Congress succumbing to the demands of local watermen and granting an initial $350,000 budget for the Army Corp of Engineers to start cleaning up Mallows Bay. When it was revealed that the watermen had teamed up with a local power business to try to reclaim the area around Mallows Bay for private industry, the effort failed. A Maryland grant sponsored a study in March 1993 to explore the fleet at Mallows Bay and assess its disposal cost, environmental impact, and identify what boats remained for historical and archaeological interests. The researchers would locate 88 wooden ships left behind by the original EFC over the next two years. Researchers also revealed that Western Marine utilized the bay for more than simply EFC vessels. 12 barges, as well as a revolutionary war-era longboat, three 18th-century schooners, and several workboats were uncovered. Number 9. Tadamasa Itatsu Former kamikaze pilot Tadamasa Itatsu was 89 years old when he spoke with a BBC reporter about his wartime experiences. He explained that he survived his final mission because his plane experienced engine trouble, forcing him to ditch in the sea. Kamikaze pilots who returned from their missions were grouped into two categories, those who failed to carry out their orders due to factors that were outside of their control and those who aborted their missions due to psychological reasons. Because Itatsu came back to his unit due to mechanical problems, he fell into the group of pilots who were not frowned upon or punished for returning alive. It would have been much different if he had turned back out of fear, which would have labeled him a coward and subjected him to harsh punishment. But even those who were accused of chickening out of their final flight were spared from punishment because the Japanese were already at a shortage of skilled pilots. Their missions were rescheduled and their superiors ensured that they remained in condition to fly. There was a limit on how many times a pilot could return, however, and at one point, the Japanese military announced that any kamikaze pilot who returned from missions nine times would be executed. Itatsu's final flight was never rescheduled because the war ended. For years, he kept quiet about his role in the war and was riddled with survivor's guilt. He even considered taking his own life many times. It wasn't until the 1970s when Itatsu began asking the families of fallen comrades for mementos and photos of the men that his healing journey began. Over the years, he amassed a huge collection which includes farewell letters written by kamikaze pilots. Through his efforts to preserve their memory, Itatsu finally came to terms with his survival and felt a sense of purpose. Number 8. Kaoru Hasegawa On May 25, 1945, kamikaze pilot Kaoru Hasegawa zeroed in on the American ship USS San Francisco as his suicide target in the waters off Okinawa. As he began his approach, his plane was shot down by gunners who fired from the nearby USS West Virginia and USS Callahan. In keeping with the standard practice of rescuing any surviving friends or foes, sailors plucked Hasegawa from the water and brought him aboard the Callahan. He was unconscious and later told the spokesman review that when he awoke, he thought he was going to be executed. Instead, Hasegawa and the American service members who rescued him exchanged forgiveness and mementos and embraced each other before he was transferred to another battleship and then sent to a POW camp in Hawaii. He was eventually released and returned to Japan to live out what was, by all accounts, a normal life. But Hasegawa never forgot about the men aboard the Callahan who saved his life and how the exchange taught him a lesson about how former enemies can become friends. He spent a year tracking the crew members down through military records and then traveled to the U.S. in 1995, 50 years after the harrowing rescue, to thank them personally at an emotional reunion. During his visit, Hasegawa visited the Navy Memorial in Washington, where he laid a wreath and donated $10,000 to the Memorial Fund in honor of the crew. Number 7. Hisao Horiyama when 21-year-old Hisao Horiyama received a piece of paper in late 1944 asking if he was willing to kill himself in the name of the Japanese war effort, he readily volunteered. As it became clear that Japan was losing the war, he saw it as his duty to step up and do whatever was necessary to try helping his country regain an upper hand, even if that meant flying a plane into an American ship knowing full well that he wouldn't survive. 
Horiyama felt even more strongly called to the cause when the emperor visited his unit on a white horse, later telling the guardian that it was as if the leader was personally requesting their services. In addition to his loyalty to his country, Horiyama said that he and his fellow soldiers were conditioned to suppress their emotions. So when it came to the prospect of dying, they reacted much differently than most people probably would and simply accepted what they thought was their destiny. Horiyama never went on the flight of death he had prepared for by the time Japan surrendered, and he initially felt guilty for not making the ultimate sacrifice for his country. He later recalled feeling like he had let down a lot of people, including his father who he was trying to prove himself to. Shortly before she died, Horiyama's mother told him that she never would have forgiven his father if she had lost a son in a kamikaze attack, perhaps offering the man some long-awaited reassurance that his survival was a good thing. Number 6. Kazuo Odachi Kazuo Odachi was just 17 years old when he became a kamikaze pilot for the Japanese Navy. By then, he was pretty sure that Japan would lose the war and he was willing to die for his country, but had conflicted feelings about the difference between a meaningful sacrifice and throwing his life away. He nevertheless volunteered for the role and went through the training with the expectation that at some point it would be his turn to die for the war effort. After surviving the Battle of Leyte Gulf, Odachi escaped to Taiwan. Starting in April 1945, he was sent on several suicide bombing missions over a 10-month period. He managed to survive each time for one reason or another and was about to embark on yet another suicide flight when a fellow military member ran out to the runway and stopped him. The emperor had just surrendered and the war was finally officially over. Odachi moved on with his life. He got married and never spoke about his past as a kamikaze pilot, even to his wife, out of a fear that people would judge or stereotype him. Finally, in 2016, he started opening up about his role in the war as the attitudes and culture surrounding it began to change. He even wrote a book called Memoirs of a Kamikaze, which came out on the 75th anniversary of the war's end. Speaking with the New York Times, Odachi said that he hoped his story would remind people of the humanity of the kamikaze pilots whose lives were sacrificed and the pressure they were under to fulfill Imperial Japan's vision. He summed up his thoughts into a poignant statement, there wasn't a single person among us who would have decided on their own to die. Number 5. Hisashi Tetsuka Hisashi Tetsuka was among a group of university students who were drafted in 1945 as the Japanese military sought to replenish its depleting soldiers. One day, he and other recruits were asked whether they were willing to go on a suicide mission. They had three options for their response, to volunteer eagerly, to simply volunteer, or to say that they wished not to join. While most of the pilots knew their answers right away and were soon out the door, Tetsuka and several others found themselves having conflicting feelings. He later said that he didn't particularly want to become a kamikaze pilot, but felt obligated to serve what felt like a duty to his nation and family, so he ultimately volunteered. Tetsuka was granted five days' leave to visit his family before the planned mission, but couldn't bear to tell them about the role he had taken on. Like many other kamikaze pilots, he was stopped short of his final mission by Japan's surrender while en route to his base to carry out the attack. He later told the press, at 93 years old, that his mind went blank upon realizing that he wasn't about to die. He moved on with his life and started a business as he found himself too sick of war to remain in the military and unfazed by the prospect of flying a commercial jet. By all accounts, Tetsuka lived an average but fulfilling life after the war. He had grandchildren and even became friends with some American farmers who were living in Japan, although he kept quiet about his role in the war when he went to see them. If you were drafted into the military and asked to be a kamikaze pilot, which of the three options would be your response? Let us know in the comments below and hit subscribe while you're at it. Number 4. Ryozo Kotoge Imperial Japanese Navy pilot Ryozo Kotoge was just 17 years old when he received orders for what was supposed to be his final mission. The young man had just witnessed the bombing of Nagasaki from a neighboring city when he was told to prepare for an attack against the Americans. Like many others, Kotoge's life was saved at the 11th hour when Japan surrendered to the Allies shortly before his scheduled departure. He waited for a truck to come pick him up, but it never arrived. Kotoge didn't fully understand what was going on until several days later when he managed to tune into a radio broadcast from Emperor Hirohito announcing that Japan had lost the war. His unit was demobilized a week later and he was sent home. In hindsight, he thinks he received his suicide mission orders late because he had to receive treatment for malaria and that this may have also played a key role in saving his life. Speaking with the Asahi Shimbun in 2020 at the age of 92, Kotoge explained that he initially suffered from survivor's guilt but was glad to return to his hometown. While traveling there, his train unexpectedly stopped in Hiroshima where he stepped outside and saw human bodies being piled up and lit on fire. 
Like Nagasaki, the U.S. had dropped a nuclear bomb on the city, causing mass civilian casualties and leveling much of it to the ground. He went on to work for his local government and mostly kept quiet about his wartime experience until after he retired. He began opening up after being invited to his grandkids' school to talk about it, which led to him speaking at numerous other schools. Kotoge became a staunch advocate for peace after the war and said that he thinks it's important to pass his story on to younger generations to prevent such destructive violence from happening ever again in Japan. Number 3. Yoshiomi Anai Unlike many kamikaze pilots who were spared from going on their final missions by Japan's surrender, Yoshiomi Yanai lived because he failed to locate his target during what was supposed to be his suicide flight. This type of error was reportedly rare for a kamikaze operation, making Yanai's survival notably exceptional. By the time he departed for the mission, he had written his final words to his parents. He kept it for the rest of his life, along with a collection of photos that show him and his fellow soldiers enjoying some happy moments before embarking on what was, for many, the last flight of their lives. Yanai was just one of the many kamikaze pilots that author Maxwell Taylor Kennedy sought to understand better for his 2008 book called Danger's Hour. Kennedy was surprised to find that instead of encountering radicals who had harbored extreme ideologies, he met with men who weren't much different from young people from the U.S. or any other country, who found themselves feeling conflicted between their patriotism and other values. In this sense, learning about the kamikaze pilots has helped to humanize their experience and look past long-held stereotypes and misunderstandings. Number 2. Kenichiro Unuki Kamikaze pilot Kenichiro Unuki was on his way to attack an American fleet off Okinawa in 1945 when his plane experienced sudden engine problems. He landed the aircraft and was rescued by the Japanese Navy, who questioned him about his mission's failure. In the meantime, Japan surrendered to the Allied powers, bringing the war to an end. It meant that Unuki no longer had to carry out his suicide mission. Sixty years later, he told the History Net journalist Lawrence Rees that his survival had left him with a sense of burden. Unuki knew that he wasn't supposed to be alive, but he saw it as an opportunity to dispel common myths and stereotypes surrounding kamikaze pilots including the widely held notion that they eagerly killed themselves for what they saw as a greater imperial cause. Like many others who found themselves being asked the same question, Unuki and some of his fellow soldiers felt both conflicted and flabbergasted by the request to participate in the so-called special mission. But they worried that there would be consequences if they didn't volunteer, including perhaps the social alienation of their families or their parents being told that they were a coward and a failure. The men also suspected that if they failed to sign up as kamikaze pilots, they'd be sent to the most dangerous parts of the war, where they'd likely die anyway, but in a less honorable way. Unuki ultimately volunteered and spent the next several months training for his final flight. His first scheduled departure was canceled due to mechanical issues. He flew out the next day, mentally prepared to die, but a faulty engine spared his life. Number 1. Takahiko Ena 20-year-old Takahiko Ena was drafted into the Japanese Navy in April 1945, by which point the country's military was fighting a losing battle in the war. He was sent to the island of Kyushu, where he was told that he and two other men would pilot a bomb-laden plane into an Allied ship with just enough fuel for a one-way trip. Ena's orders were part of a mission codenamed Operation Kikusui, which sought to bomb Allied vessels during the Battle of Okinawa. By then, many of Japan's fighter planes had become obsolete against the enemy's rapidly advancing technology. The aircraft were stripped and refitted specifically for suicide missions, but they often experienced mechanical issues along the way and were shot down. Ena was unable to even get his plane off the ground for his first scheduled mission, and he was forced to make an emergency landing after taking off for a second planned bombing due to engine trouble. During his third flight, Ena's plane experienced engine trouble, forcing him to crash land in the sea. He survived the ditching and was rescued, and by the time a Japanese submarine came to retrieve him, the country had surrendered. While the war's end left some surviving kamikaze pilots feeling like they had failed to fulfill their duty, Ena was relieved. He told The Guardian in 2015 at 92 years old that while he felt sad about the friends he'd lost, he looked forward to the rebuilding of Japan. Even in his older years, decades after the war's end, Ena praised the country's pacifist constitution, which avoids war at all costs. Thanks for watching. What did you think of these stories from former kamikaze pilots? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks again and we'll see you next time for another amazing video right here on American Eye.